welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, where we discuss the latest news, rumors, and games of the NFL and college football. As always, I'm your host, Jeremiah, and we are here for episode 165, and it is officially Super Bowl week, guys. Yes, officially Super Bowl week. We are literally six days away from the Super Bowl being played. And I'm I'm telling you right now, I am excited. It's bittersweet. And you know, it's really it's really hard to to let football go for pretty much I think for like what six or seven months. So it's gonna be hard. It's bittersweet, but I before we before the Super Bowl is even played, we actually had an NFL game yesterday it wasn't it was an exhibition game but still it was football nonetheless that is the nfl pro bowl the nfl pro bowl was last night and it was actually a competitive game it was probably a lot closer than some of the well most of the nfl playoffs this year a lot of it it was very competitive it was very competitive to the end and I got to say, like, a lot of people did not watch this game. I don't know a lot of people that watched it, but for those that did see it, it got really good at the end. It got really good at the end. Uh, I'll admit I didn't watch the first half of the game. I did. I just kept I just kept up with the score on my phone. But I did catch the second half, and I haven't seen – the pro the pro ball played this fast like ever. The score for the game was twenty to thirteen with the AFC coming up on top over the NFC, and I just don't know what it was. Just something about the Pro Bowl this year that was a lot different. Was that because of the incentive of sixty thousand? Was it because of that? Maybe I don't know, but you know the AFC. Did have a halftime league of fourteen to seven, and then they scored two field goals to make it twenty to seven. Then the NFC scored a touchdown. Actually, no, they scored two field goals. Sorry, two field goals to make it thirteen to twenty. Had a chance to tie it up at the end, but Kirk Cousins threw a interception to Lorenzo Alexander, who was co MVP with Kansas City tight end Travis Kelsey. So I just gotta say, like, there's just this, uh, like, there's just some takeaways, the few things I took away from this Pro Bowl. Well, when Kirk Cousins did throw that interception late in the game, uh, he actually did something that a lot of uh, that I actually haven't seen. Uh, he he literally hustled his way towards uh, Akeem Talib, who. You know, had the who had the ball after he intercepted. Well, Lorenzo Alexander intercepted the pass, and then Alexander ladder he did a lateral to a keep to leap. And then when a keep to leap was close to, it looks like he was about to score. Kirk Cousins chased him down and swiped it with his right hand. Uh, you know, he it caused uh, to leap to. You know, cause a, it caused to leave to fumble the ball and prevent a touchdown. You know, both players weren't injured, but man, I was actually getting kind of scared there. I, I, I was like, I didn't want to hear Cousins get hurt there. I really thought he was going to get hurt, but you know, our co- Cousins said on ESPN that he just wanted to win. He wanted to win, and that is why he went for went for a fumble. And then I'm surprised that he did do that because you know, well, I'm not surprised that he wanted to win, but. You know, Cousins is set to make a lot of money this offseason, uh, whether he stays with the Redskins or not. But the fact that Kirk Cousins played that hard for a game that was meaningless, that should say a lot to Washington to lock him up. That should lock him up right now. He has a certain... I just feel that Kirk Cousins just had a certain pedigree that the Redskins haven't had in a quarterback in a long time. And I saw it yesterday in a very meaningless game. Uh, I just, I just think that I think the Redskins were a little 
were a little worried there for a little bit. But Kirk Cousins showed that he is a he is a player. He he, he has a lot of heart when he plays the game. And I do think he if he doesn't get a big contract, I do think he's going to get a franchise tag from Washington. But uh, regardless, if he gets a big contract or not, I think he actually deserves it. Because when was the last time the Redskins had a franchise quarterback? I don't. I don't remember at all. And maybe probably like Joe Theismann. It's been a while. Well, you know, with the AFC winning the the game 20-13, it was one of the most competitive Pro Bowls that I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I think maybe that the players are a little more motivated because they were playing in front of a larger attendance. And, you know, uh, Akeem Tlaib said that it was probably the most competitive Pro Bowl that he's played in. Everest Griffin from the Minnesota Vikings said that, you know, it was he wanted to win. So there's a lot of competitive. You know, I think it's really good for the Pro Bowl moving forward that this game is now competitive and it was a it was a very it was a defensive game through throughout the first half and the NFC defense was actually really good they they sat they had seven sacks compared to the AFC's two so I do I do like the fact that the end that the Pro Bowl is getting more competitive I think if they tweak the skills competition just a little bit uh, I do think that the game is heading in the right direction because uh, I remember like Pro Bowls that they will like they will have scores of like 52 to like 49. Like there'll be like no defense played. A, a, a base it'd be like the equivalent of a seven on seven competition. But I do like that the Pro Bowl. Is, I do like that it was competitive. I do. I think it's. I think it's really good. You know. I think. I think if the Pro Bowl is like this, it will. It will a lot of people will tune in for sure because this is a week where there's no football at all, and you know, people that people that really miss out on watching football would love to tune into the Pro Bowl. Would they want to see a competitive game? And I do think if the Pro Bowl does stay like this, then it's then it can be good moving forward for audiences on TV. Well. Another like storyline that happened before the Pro Bowl was, was you know it was Des Bryant. He was interviewed by ESPN, and he said that Odell Beckham is fairly unfairly understood. He's misunderstood. He says that he is misunderstood and he has been unfairly subjected to criticism, and. He thinks that if he care if players care about the game the way he does, then they'll be a champion. But this is coming from a guy that hasn't even won a Super Bowl, Des Bryant. And this is what he told ESPN. Whenever something doesn't go right as far as the team lost, y'all don't like his actions. And all it is is just wanting him to win the game. If more people were like that on his team, maybe they should do something special. Well, you know, Odell Beckham, I do, okay, to be fair, maybe he is, maybe he is uh, treated a little unfairly to the media, but I kind of think Odell Beckham kind of does that to himself. Does Bryant, you know, he kind of, kind of is in the same category there. You know, Des Bryant and Odell Beckham are almost like the same player. They are very... I, th- I think they're very inconsistent. Although Beckham will have a game of like 115 yards and then they'll have like 35 the next game. There's Bryant. You know, he's kind of the same way. Well, even though Beckham finished with the third most receiving touchdowns, not the third most receiving touchdowns, but the third most receiving yards this year, he was expected to play a lot better. And the... In the playoffs. And the Giants, in the Giants playoff game against the Packers, Beckham couldn't, he couldn't do anything. 
He dropped a pair of passes, only produced 28 yards. That was the second fewest ever in his career. And remember, this was before he took that infamous Miami boat trip. So, of course, the media was going to criticize Odell Beckham on that. But to be fair, Odell Beckham's only 24 years old, and I still think he has... I still think he has a lot more potential and if he, he has a lot growing up to do. And Des Bryant, you know, he has been looked at as a prima donna as well. So I'm not surprised that Des Bryant did say it, but to be fair, I do agree that maybe Odell Beckham is a little unfairly because whenever he has a good game, the media praises him. Whenever he has a bad game, the media criticizes him. And why is that? Is it because of the antics? Possibly. But I just think that for Beckham to not get publicly criticized is basically just, you know, just stay quiet and just produce on the field. And I kind of do think Des Bryant should do the same thing as well. And he's done a, you know, he he's had his troubles and all that. And I just think that's the best solution. Just stay quiet and just produce on the field. Well, I'm going to take my first break. And when I get back, I'm going to discuss the GM hires of the 49ers and the Indianapolis Colts. When I get back to the Going to Meet Concepts football podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Well, the last two general manager vacancies have been filled as of last night. The Indianapolis Colts have hired Chris Ballard as a new general manager. And the San Francisco 49ers have hired Hall of Fame candidate and Fox Sports analyst John Lynch to be their general manager. And the John Lynch hired uh, happens after there was a... uh, after there was a mystery candidate that had emerged throughout last week. And Chris Ballard, he comes from the Kansas City organization. So Chris Ballard has, he's in a real great situation. Chris Ballard has Andrew Luck, T.Y. Hilton, and Dante Moncrief. And he, he t- he's going to take over for Ryan Grigson, who hasn't happened to draft well in the defensive side of the ball. And that was something that has plagued the Indianapolis Colts for the past two years. On the other hand, the 49ers hire a guy with no front office experience. And don't get me wrong, John Lynch was a great defensive player when he was active. And... He is a former Stanford standout, so maybe that had maybe you know there is a reason that he went back to the Bay Area. But the the thing I can't get over of the 49ers hire is the Niners signed John Lynch to a six year contract, a six year contract for a first time GM with no front office experience at all. And the Niners are actually going to offer Kyle Shanahan a six-year contract as well. And that's a lot for a first-year head coach. So I just don't know what the thought process of Jay York was when he hired John Lynch over Terry McDonough and George Payton. I don't know what the thought process was in that. 
And, you know, with the way that the 49ers have uh, been run since the hardball days, been a little dysfunctional. And this continues to be the most Jed York move I've ever seen. And during the Falcons, I think it was the Falcons and Seattle game. Yeah, Falcons and Seattle game. And when John Lynch, I think John Lynch was the com was in the booth for that game for Fox. And John Lynch, when he was talking about Kyle Shanahan on the broadcast, he said, I'll hire that guy in a minute. Well, apparently he's going to work with him. So, I'm very surprised by the Niners making this move to John Lynch. I just think six years is way too much. It is way too much. But... The fact that you didn't hire guys that have previous front office experience over a an NFL play by play commentator, I just it says a lot about the ownership. You know, Terry McDonough looked like he was going to be the guy to work with to work with Kyle Shanahan. And Kyle Shannon is not even the coach yet. Is Kyle Shannon still even gonna like is he even gonna still come to the Niners after this? I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see how John Lynch uh deals with personnel issues and you know, just being a front office role. As for the Colts, you know, Ballard is coming from Kansas City where he was the team's director of football operations. He and he's had really great success. He, they have built a really good defense there in Kansas City. He worked his way up from being a scout in the NFL and he, all the way to being a team director of football operations. And the past four years, he's been with Kansas City. The franchise spent three of their first round picks on Eric Fisher. Offensive lineman, D Ford, a linebacker, and Marcus Peters, who had been really who had been really great players for this team ever since they came into the league. They passed significant roles. And, you know, the Chiefs don't have a first round pick this year. But, you know, they also had they also had Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill. They've they've had really great drafts. And that's what the Colts need right now. They need someone that can that knows how to evaluate talent and it seems like Ryan Grixon couldn't do that and for the Colts he did a great job in his first year as a general manager for Indianapolis you know he did obviously drafted Andrew Luck he drafted T.Y. Hilton and Dwayne Allen but you know over the years it just didn't pan out the way that he thought it would and for the Colts, you know, they look like they're a team that needed a lot of help on the defensive side of the ball, on the offensive line. And I just, I love this move because I think that, you know, it gives, it gives the Colts a guy that knows how to evaluate talents and he has a very successful track record. And he's done a good, and not only that, but, Colts have they have some talent on that team. Uh, you know I can't argue about the offensive talent on that team. It's just the defense is very questionable, and I do think that Ballard can help get some defensive players in too, so they can be a Super Bowl contender. And you know we thought that the Colts were, well at least I did. I thought the Colts were going to be a Super Bowl contender like two years ago. And they could they didn't even make it to the playoffs. So you know Ryan Grigson's biggest downfalls was his was in his, was in his inability to draft well, especially on defense. You know his best draft was his first draft, which was Andrew Luck, Dwayne Allen, and T. Y. Hilton. But after that, you know he he passed on guys like Malcolm Brown, Landon Collins. And he decided to select Philip Dorsett instead of those guys. So, 
I like this move for uh for the Kansas City, not for Kansas City, but for the Indianapolis Colts. I think they're getting a real good guy. And I think he has the type of knowledge that Jim Ursay wants in a general manager. But as for the 49ers, I just don't get it. Uh he this is gonna be he has a lot John Lynch has a lot of work. He has a very hard job coming up. But Chris Ballard, I really do like to hire. Well, I'm going to take my last break. And when I get back, I'm going to discuss uh, the future of Minnesota Vikings quarterback Teddy Bridgewater. When we get back to the Ghost of Me Concepts football podcast. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. Well, it looks like that Teddy Bridgewater may not play in 2017. According to a report from Bleacher Report reports Jason Cole. Tay Bridgewater can miss the entire 2017 season as he continues to recover from knee surgery. And this is very tough because, you know, Bridgewater is still young. He's only been in the league. Well, he technically only has one year, and he's about to enter his third actual year in the NFL. But, you know, Bridgewater was a central piece of Minnesota's offense and building process. And due to a a really tough injury, a knee injury last August, you know, doctors told the team that he would need at least 19 months to heal. And, you know, when the Vikings got Sam Bradford, you know, he actually just he actually did fairly well at times, but you know, the Vikings went eight and eight, they missed the playoffs. And I think I think the Vikings really have a really have a tough choice coming up after this season. Cause if Bridgewater Bridgewater is not going to play, then I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't play. When Bridgewater finally comes back healthy. And he's ready to play. Are the Vikings going to trade him? Are they? Because, you know, they gave up a lot for Sam Bradford. They gave up like two first round picks for a guy who hasn't won a whole lot of games. You know, he did. Sam Bradford did have a a very good year. You know, he had 20 touchdowns, five interceptions. But there were times when he just looked like he couldn't throw the ball past five yards. That may may be because of the offensive line issues there that may have some play into it. But I do think that, you know, the Vikings have a really tough choice coming up regarding Teddy Bridgewater. Regarding, regarding Teddy Bridgewater. And, you know, I liked, I liked, I enjoyed watching Teddy Bridgewater when he was in Louisville. And I really thought he was one of those guys that, you know, was going to be a really good player. But apparently, you know, the vali- the credibility of this report from Jason Cole, it looks like that it's not actually confirmed. It looks like that, you know, the Vikings are still in wait and see mode for Teddy Bridgewater, which I completely understand. You know, you, it's if the doctors haven't told you that anything's not confirmed, then, yeah, you know, you have to wait and see. But, you know, it appears that they ruled out the possibility he could return in 2017. And, you know, there and, and there was no update on Teddy Bridgewater's rehab on his knee. And, you know, uh, Ble- the report from Bleacher Report said that 
Bridgewater would need until March 2018. But Bridgewater's agent, Kenner McGuire, told Adam Schefter that you should not overreact to a story that has zero substance and zero credibility. So, even if this report of Teddy Bridgewater is true, missing the 2017 season, I think that the Vikings have a very tough decision coming up. Like, do you want to keep a guy that you traded two first-round picks for, or do you want to keep the guy that you drafted in the first round and that you looked as a building block, but is coming off probably a tough ACL injury? And it's a tough injury. It's not a normal knee knee injury, guys. Not. So they have a tough decision coming up. And, you know, Adrian Peterson's probably not going to be back when Teddy Bridgewater is fully healthy. So they look like they have to. No matter who is the quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings, they have to find. They have to find guys. They have to find really good guys for the offensive line and they have to find a replacement for Adrian Peterson and that's going to be tough to do that is going to be tough to do well it is Super Bowl week and I decided to bring a little fun fact for you guys here well you know it looks like that the Patriots are wearing white and the Falcons are going to wear red All I got to say is that out of the last 11 out of 12 years, the team that were white have won the Super Bowl. The only time it hasn't happened was when the Packers defeated the Steelers in 2011. So I just got to say, there may be the spell shovel for the Falcons wearing red. But I just want to throw that little fun fact out there for you guys as we get pumped up for Super Bowl 51. But, you know, you know, New England is 2-1 wearing the white jerseys. And I think the last time we saw the Pats wearing color was when they were 18-0 and and they were 18-0. and before they lost to Giants in the Super Bowl. So maybe that's the reason why they haven't wear <laughs> maybe that's the reason why they haven't wear their blue jerseys in forever. But I just want to put that fun fact out there. Teams that were white jerseys have won eleven of the last twelve Super Bowls. So maybe the Falcons made a poor choice of attire there. Well that concludes today's show. Uh you know to you come back tomorrow. We're gonna have I'm gonna discuss News regarding opening night, which is tonight in Houston. I believe it's at Minute Maid Park. And anything that happens in the past, in in the next 24 hours. And we are going to be here all week. And as we pumped you guys up for Super Bowl 51, I can't wait for the game. I think it's going to be a good one. But I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in. As always, I'm Jeremiah. And thank you for tuning in to the Going to Me Concepts Football Podcast. You guys have a good day and have a pleasant tomorrow. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.